Welcome to the Solid Verbal. The Solid Verbal. Come after me! I'm a man! I'm 40! I've heard so many players say, well, I want to be happy. You want to be happy for a day? Eat a steak. It's that woo woo! And now, Dan and Ty. Welcome back to the Solid Verbal, boys and girls. My name is Ty Hildebrand. I am joined, as always, by my good friend and co-host, a gentleman seated about eight feet in front of me. If that, yeah. He goes by the name of Dan Rubenstein. Sir, why are we... What, what, oh, man. Our what, setup what, what's is very going on strange. Yeah. So, welcome to New York, as Thank our you. good friend Taylor Swift would right. point out. It's been waiting for me. So, I am in the audio coffin where I normally record, but the tiny cube-like room in which the audio coffin is located, the door is open and you are seated just outside of it with your laptop on a stool and a microphone propped on two metal yeah, ottoman what are these? type things. You, you put your feet up on there. I don't know. It's like a coffee table. Yeah. yeah. So, we've rigged together a setup. It is Sunday midday. You made your way to New York and we decided because... You know, while the while the Kate is out, the mice will play. I guess something like it that. It rhymes. It rhymes. Um, so we're doing our week eight recap in person. I'm excited. Thank you for having me up here. Of course. And of course, as I did drop my lovely wife off at the airport at 4 a.m. this morning, <laughs> I came to a bit of a dilemma last night, deep into the night. Okay. Because as you know, there was a bit of a, a bit of a nail biting football game. A snafu. Yeah. That transpired in the uh, cold depths of central Pennsylvania between yeah. Penn State and Ohio State. So I kind of came to this impasse where I'm like, I can either go to bed now mm -hmm. at the end of the third quarter and make do with just catching up early in the morning before I make the drive, or I can soldier forth and I can <laughs> watch this whole thing transpire. And I did. Yeah. And I'm glad I did you. because what a game. Yeah. Did you freak out? I didn't freak out. No. Um, because there's another physical ailment, which maybe we'll discuss later in the show. Right. <laughs> which um, would have caused me great pain, but... You actually nailed this game precisely, by the way. You said Trace McSorley's legs would be a factor. It certainly was more of a factor than his arm. Uh, that, you this said, is true, yes. You said that even though Penn State was hurt up front, you like the gutty effort that they've put forth part yeah. of this year defensively. Um, and you said that maybe they would keep it close, maybe special teams, maybe they would be able to shut down Ohio State and Ohio State coming off of Wisconsin. You don't, you know, keep it close and weird stuff could happen. You had Ohio State winning, but you took those points. I did take the points. Um, so, good for you. Let the record show that if you've got five fingers on one hand and you hold up one or two of those fingers, that's the approximate number of games that I've gotten correctly <laughs> this Fair. year that I've so so-called nailed as as you might describe. Yeah. Let's get into Penn State here momentarily. Yes. Let's first hear from your week eight reverbs compiled by our good friend Taylor. Yes. Have a listen. O H I O O Hey, John from Boulder here. Hey guys, it's Mike Miller, the Smoking Musket. This is Jane from DC. Hi, this is Courtney in San Francisco. And I know it's a little late, but I lost my voice at least 15 hours ago because Penn State beat the spread. Home dog of the week, they beat the spread. Um, I've been married to my wife for six years, and, uh, and in that time, I have never once bought her Yakos. Today, in honor of Penn State being the home dog of the week, we bought Yakos for the first time in forever. James Franklin has a win against a team that has a number next to their name. It's 90 minutes from Penn State beating Ohio State, and I am still not 100% sure it actually happened. Don't ask me why he bet the house on a 38 and a half point line, but Jim Harbaugh remains a, an unpredictable little mink. Michigan wins, Michigan State loses, and Ohio State loses. This is like the greatest college football weekend ever. I know the guy who edits these is like a Terrapin guy, so I'm sure he's pumped. Red Show Radio or whatever. But as an MSU fan, I'm just so sad right now. Yeah, I'm currently in Las Vegas for a buddy's bachelor party. They're all downstairs gambling, having fun. I stayed in the room just to watch Alabama get revenge on Trevor Knight. Full tide. Uh, I've been in the airport pretty much all day long, about to head to Disney World, but watched a little bit of my Aggies lose to Alabama, and 
gotta admit, I'm probably pretty glad that I didn't have to watch that whole game. Turns out uh, the streak is up to 10, 10 games in a row in which Alabama has uh, gotten either a defensive or special teams touchdown. I tell you, November can't come soon enough for Arkansas because guess who just got murdered? I'm an Auburn fan sitting here watching Auburn, Arkansas, and this is absolutely borderline erotic. It's week eight. And in sole possession of second place in the SEC East is Kentucky? In February, the Sooners and the Red Raiders combined to score 128 points in a basketball game. And tonight, they scored a robust 125. 1,700 total yards. Texas Tech, Oklahoma. Just want to let you know, it's time to talk to your kids about an undefeated West Virginia. So I'm sitting here watching the West Virginia game, and I'm fairly certain with as much stoppage time as there has been, I probably could have cooked cold pork. And I just want to know the address that I can use to send Dan the thank you note for uh, the jinx on Texas, and where I can send the thank you note to Texas for gift wrapping that game for us. The South goes through Salt Lake, baby. We're going. We're going. We're going to the Pac-12 championship. Give it up. Go Utes! Just wanted to alert you that Joe Williams ripped off another giant chunk of yardage and possibly a touchdown. Go Utes and Cubs. It's been 10 years in the making. Glad to be going bowling again. Go Buff. I just got done watching the, the horrible 10-5 to score Colorado versus Stanford. I just got to say, the Notre Dame stink is real. Stanford is horrendous. It is almost... 2.30 in the morning on the East Coast, and I just watched BYU lose by one yet again. Patrick Mahomes in a losing effort. The ultimate losing effort. Patrick Mahomes, 52 completions for 734 yards, five touchdowns, one interception. In a losing effort, gentlemen. And I just want to give a shout out to Pat Mahomes in a losing effort. Pat Mahomes in one of the greatest losing efforts of all time. All right, so there you have it, Dan. Reverbs, lively as always. I saw we had a bunch coming through Mm -hmm. as of like an hour ago. (laughs) For some folks, it's cathartic to sleep on it, right? And then then call in a little bit after the fact. I guess we got to start, though, with the Penn State-Ohio State game. As many have noted, this is kind of like the big upset so far in this college football season. Number two, Ohio State on the road. They go down at the hands of my Penn State and Nittany Lions, 24 to 21. How deep into the night did you stay up for this? Let's be uh, honest here. I'm going to be, this is a, this is an area of uh, honesty and, and truthfulness. I did not stay up for the end of this game. I was worn down and I went to sleep and I watched the end this morning as we record. Did you go to bed earlier on Saturday night or earlier on Friday night Ooh. as Oregon was playing Cal? I went to sleep earlier Saturday night. I stayed up until halftime of that game because those are the priorities. You know, a completely meaningless Friday night Pac-12 game outside of, um, you know, the the sort of stories that care that I care about. But yeah, I, I went to sleep earlier Friday, even though it was it was 21-7, I think, at the time I went to sleep. I was like, all right, they're, they're going to win this yeah. game 33-10 to 10 or something like that. And I just, I was exhausted and figured I could wake up early and watch, and I did. And I was pleasantly surprised that I was wrong in my decision. So the game goes to 21-7, mm-hmm. and I had the same exact sentiment as you. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking there's just no way, because Penn State really offensively didn't mount what you would consider a charge. Trace McSorley yeah. only completed like eight passes yeah. in this entire football Third of his game. Throws. He he is not at the point yet. He may get there. He's only a sophomore, but he clearly doesn't have arm talent, as <laughs> I heard Chris Fowler kindly refer to it. Yeah. He doesn't have that. And some of the passes that he was completing, they were big passes, but they were kind of lollipops. Right. His touchdown throw was a great throw. He did a great job putting the ball where it needed to go, but mm-hmm. every time you see it go up, trying to cut into that central Pennsylvania wind mm-hmm. and the snow and the rain or whatever the heck was going on out there, it is a bit unnerving, but he got it where it needed to go. He is. My point is he is not going to beat you through the air moving forward. Okay. But what he did do was provide moxie. <laughs> moxie. Okay. My Penn State friends and I texted countless times last night. Mm-hmm. Moxie is what he brought to the equation. Yeah, and as did JT Barrett, by the way. It was just a rough night, yeah. Absolutely. What I was most impressed by, Trace McSorley and Saquon Barkley aside, 
was the resolve of the Penn State defense because they've mm-hmm. been bruised and battered all year long. I thought I saw somewhere along the line they lost like seven linebackers to injury. It helped to get Jason Cabinda and Brandon Bell back. Mm-hmm. Bell hadn't played for four weeks, Dan. He had 19 tackles last night. Not bad. That's a good number. That's a pretty good reintroduction to Big Ten football. Mm-hmm. And the line, my gosh, for as good as Ohio State's offensive line has been this year, how good was Penn State's defensive line continually getting pressure on Bell? I was going to say, an incredible pass rush. It was just outstanding. They kept him from being comfortable back there. They certainly kept the running game in check. So Mm -hmm. I think just a combination of factors with Trace McSorley not giving up on plays, making plays with his legs, with the defense obviously stepping up, and then some bigger plays in the special teams game. That was what enabled Penn State to... uh, spring itself free and get... I got the 24 points right. (laughs) You did. Ohio State didn't get 31. They got 21, but I got the 24 side of that equation correct. And uh, James Franklin, very emotional. The team, very emotional. Mm -hmm. This is a big win in a number of ways that people who aren't tied to the Penn State program probably couldn't comprehend. This is a big deal for them. Yeah, if you had the defense and special teams of Penn State in your fantasy team on your fantasy team yesterday, then life is good. Yeah. Because, and it, this is the surprise too, because Urban Meyer teams, traditionally speaking, are so good on special teams. They don't make mistakes. And last night, Penn State took it uh, clearly with the block and for the win, yeah. clearly took advantage of mistakes made by Ohio State. And defensively, I, I think you nailed it perfectly. Getting the linebackers was enormous in an atmosphere like the whiteout is. The fact that they were able to channel the emotion of the crowd and not lose focus for a single play against a very dangerous offense. I mean, we can see you make one single mistake and Curtis Samuel's gone for 77 or whatever that, that touchdown run yeah. was. So... The fact that they didn't lose focus for the most part, they were swarming the backfield constantly, that they were tackling in a sure way. Uh, it was Cabinda with 19 tackles. Bell. Bell with 19 yeah, tackles. Yeah, Cabinda's presence sure. well, was absolutely felt. He gave them more of a veteran presence at the linebacking position. And mm-hmm. without those two guys, I think it's a much different football game. The fact that they were able to get back in there and um, you know provide that level of experience against a really good offense. Yep. For Ohio State, JT Barrett still had, I thought, a pretty good game. He just couldn't get comfortable. They couldn't get the run game going. My question to you, because we got to move on and talk about some other games. We saw Michigan won 41 to 8. Before this game, everything pointed towards this being a collision course in the Big Ten East between Ohio State and Michigan. I still feel like that is true. Okay. And even despite the fact that Ohio State lost, I don't think you can rule them out of the playoff conversation at this point, can you? No, if Ohio State beats Michigan, it's a three-way tie in the East, right? Yeah. So there the conversation will continue. And of course, that's what's going to happen. And the game is in Columbus, right? The Michigan-Ohio State game. But yes, I think that's looking ahead. Moving forward, James Franklin has signature win. I think it's fair to say. His seat is decidedly less tepid. Today, at least. Yes. Yeah. Today, at least. But the rest of Penn State's schedule is pretty nice. I mean, we're spending a lot of time on an unranked team, but a soon-to-be ranked team. And yeah, Penn State, I think they have Michigan State. They have Purdue. It's, like It's all teams that they can win. If you can beat Ohio State. Yes. If you have that they, ability. They should be favored in those games. Yeah. Penn State has, they're 5-2 and two now. So eight wins now is totally fine. Nine wins is totally realistic. Purdue, Iowa, Indiana, Rutgers, Michigan State. Michigan State coming off of a Maryland loss and still is looking for their first Big Ten win. Rutgers is god-awful. Hope they improve, but they're god-awful right now. By the way, great Rutgers story. Okay. Great. <laughs> really really hitting the biggies in college football with yeah, Penn we're State gonna, Rutgers. Yeah, we're going to go to the yeah. Bama game here momentarily. Yeah. Right up here. Mm-hmm. Driving I-95 north. Mm-hmm. Right there. Field of view. Big and tall and on the left-hand side of the road. Rutgers logo, Big Ten build. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Are they advertising a rebuilding program? I think so. Big Ten build might be like, hey, we are size-wise, we've got guys that are 6'2", 230. (laughs) We are of the proper size to be in the Big Ten. Was it a freebie? Billboard that they can advertise a rebuilding effort. The Big Ten has too much money, is what I think we're saying. We are saying the Big Ten has too much money. One true team of New York. So anyway, good on Penn State, big win, huge. Ohio State's going to be fine. They went into a a, a hornet's nest last night. Crazy game. I've been there for a whiteout. It's an amazing experience. It's awesome. Okay, let's move on. Let's talk SEC because the other big game, at least we thought, the biggest game of the day Mm -hmm. was going to be between Alabama 
and Texas A&M. This one was in Alabama, and it had an absurdly large point spread. Yeah, and I'm sure nothing happened with that number 19, which, by the way, is your number of the season. So the 19-point point spread and the final <laughs> margin of victory for Alabama was... 33 to 14. Which is? Quick math. That is uh, 19 points. That is 19. Ty's number of the season. Ty slowly turning into Jim Carrey from that 23 movie. Everything is 23. (laughs) What was your impression of this football game? By the way, we did have a team, again, Idaho, score 19 points in a game. We did indeed. I'm glad you paid attention to that. Uh, My impression of this game was, what can you do against Alabama other than hit on ridiculous plays for four straight quarters without making a single mistake because the margin for error against this Alabama team, and they're somehow even better than they've been in years past in terms of defensive efficiency. They're better on third downs. Uh, Jalen Hurts adds an element to this offense that they haven't had in years past to this degree. Um it's Texas A&M's a really good team. I I don't think any less I don't think of Texas A&M after this game. They did a number of good things. Trevor Knight stopped hitting passes, but he threw a number of great balls. Um Keith Ford averaged over four yards per carry, and they were able to move the ball at times in the first half. And then Alabama happens. Alabama just crushes everybody's will to live. Crockpotting? Kind of, I felt like a half crock pot. Yeah. Not a four hour crock potting, but. Right. One it was those, a smaller cut. You turn it up to to high and they yes. only do it for about two hours. Yeah, they seasoned it again with, you know, defensive touchdowns. You know, they're, they've got their go to recipe and it's working out for them. Yeah, I was really impressed again. I feel like a broken record by mm-hmm. Alabama and what they're able to do. With their rushing attack, because we've seen it, right? We've seen it time and time again. Derek They're not getting Henry. touched until the second level. You can go back to like Mark Ingram and Derrick Henry. Mm-hmm. I mean, just name these guys off. Mm-hmm. Eddie Lacy. They always have a huge bell cow back. The problem that I described when we did our Wednesday preview show is that this year they have like 15 of them. And oh, by the way, now they have a quarterback who can do it. Mm-hmm. The way that they're now able to lean on their run game is different than it has been in the past just because Jalen Hurts is so effective. Yep, you got to account for him. With his legs. And just the way that they're utilizing a dual threat guy has really put a new spin on on this offense. And Jalen Hurts was was fine throwing the football, Mm -hmm. but you can look at the box score now going back a couple weeks and you you can see clear as day that that is no longer like as big a focus as it was in previous years for... Nick Saban yep. for Lane Kiffin. It's just a totally different spin on things. It's really cool to watch if you're a Bama fan. Yes. If you're an AM fan, if you're a fan of another contending team or just any team in college football, right. it gets a little old. Mm-hmm. It does. And it gets a little frustrating because this team is just able to sustain over 60 minutes in a way that just that boa constricts the life out of you. Yeah. It's great, but not intriguing. It's something we've seen week in and week out. And what a place Alabama must be in where, take a look at, I mean, this is not a visual medium, but you have probably seen what Bo Scarborough looks like at this point. He's a bowling ball with eyes. Yes. They're like, oh, we're going to give it to him eight times against this top six team in the country, and we'll be happy with that. That's where Alabama's at right now as an offense. Yeah. He'd be getting 50 carries a game if he played for Michigan State. Yep. Or Notre Dame. Or literally any other team. Literally any other team. Um, Alabama, good on them. Lockdown defense after they went down 14-13. to 13. Yeah. It looked a little hairy there for a while, but they were able to get it together. And I guess more to the point of what a lot of us saw coming and what we described on the Wednesday show, it was a matter of consistency throughout. Alabama has it. We know they have it. Texas A&M didn't. They didn't. They were still really good, but... yeah. When they had to rely on Trevor Knight to make some big throws, he was behind guys, he was under-throwing balls. Just so tough to go against this Alabama defense. Sad to see that Eddie Jackson fractured a leg. Yeah, that's a bummer. That's a big deal for Alabama, but still so good on defense. And they forge ahead now. Is is anyone coming within 10 of Alabama? Are you an LSU guy or an Auburn guy at this point? I think I'm, that's sort I of think like, I'm more Auburn. Okay. In a weird twist of fate. So are you a Rachel or are you a Monica? Um, okay, so Auburn right now with their ability to run and their defense is more intriguing to you. I, I, I trust their quarterback a little bit more and Sean oh, yeah. White than I think of Danny Etling. And by the way, yeah, how weird is it to say that? <laughs> it is strange. Uh, and I think, well, so here's the thing, though. LSU is in Baton Rouge. The game is in Baton Rouge. And the Auburn game, I believe, is in Tuscaloosa. So there's that factor. 
There but is. I wow. think I might lean LSU a little bit. LSU. Okay, so let's talk about those two games. Yeah. Alabama won. And for the love of God, we're moving away from the SEC. Th- yeah. 33 to 14. Mm-hmm. LSU won. That was a 9 p.m. kickoff. Yep. 38 to 21 over Ole Miss. Highlighted by 16 carries, 16 ferocious carries by a now healthy Leonard Fournette who looked like he was running at one and a half speed. Unbelievable. Uh, 16 carries, 284 yards, three touchdowns, and nearly killed a man from Mm -hmm. Arkansas. A couple guys, actually. He more than tripled Trace McSorley's yards per attempt on the ground. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, A headline for this week, and not just this game, but in many, the yards per carry, yards Mm -hmm. per attempt, yards per completion in a bunch of these games. We'll talk about this a little bit more once we get to Oklahoma, (laughs) Texas Tech, (laughs) which which sort of set a new bar. Yeah. But okay, 17-point win for LSU. And then we had a, what, 53-point drubbing by Auburn, 56-3 over Arkansas. Right. It is an interesting parallel now between those two teams. What Auburn is starting to do offensively is getting kind of scary. Yeah, and not simple, but very straightforward. They threw how many passes in that game? 12? Yeah. 12 passes against what we think is at least a pretty good Arkansas team. Nothing great, but they're, you know, they do decent things. Um, Okay, let's start with LSU Ole Miss, though, because we brought that up first. Um, Leonard Fournette is uh, the running back of my dreams. (laughs) He is everything that I want to see carrying the ball forever and ever. So he blew up an Ole Miss running, or excuse me, an Ole Miss defender in the first half, I believe. And they, uh, some play calling near the end of the, the first half was a little bit dicey, but as fun as it is to watch Leonard Fournette and wish that Leonard Fournette were on your team, that defense was so good against such a tough Ole Miss offense. And they lock them. I, th- I saw that our friends at And the Valley Shook had a, a drive chart of Ole Miss's offensive production in the second half. And it was basically punt, 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 interception, punt, 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 punt. It was completely locked down. They shut Ole Miss down in the second half. That's what gives me the idea that they can be the team, hypothetically, to beat Alabama just because they got so much stronger over the course of that game. Not all 21 points are created equally. Correct. And... Certainly, that was the case here with Ole Miss. You hold them down to 21 points. We know. We've seen this team. Mm-hmm. Ole Miss is still a good team. They've got, what, four losses now? They're all right. They're, I, they're, they're a pretty good offense. I'm, I've sold off a little bit of my at, Ole Miss stock. At a minimum, they're yeah. a really good offense. Yeah. And we've seen what they can do. You hold them to 21. That That's a pretty good effort yeah. for any defense out there. And at a certain point, they're three and four. Well, that's, right. Yeah. Right. And, and I'm there with Notre Dame. Yeah. But... Still, it's not been an easy road for them. No, no, no. And I don't think you can look at any of those losses and say, ah, oh, these, these are terrible losses. Right. You know? So, okay, they lose by 17. Mm-hmm. LSU had the defense all year long. Mm-hmm. The fact that now they have the offense. The yes. fact that now they're getting more comfortable on that side of things mm-hmm. is really where I think you get that sense of hope in dealing with a team like in Alabama later on in the year. Yep. On the flip side, man, we got Auburn. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that Vegas kind of knew what they were talking about when they installed Auburn earlier in the week as a 10-point favorite. It could have been a 50-point favorite, Dan. And they would have barely covered. They would have barely covered. They ran it 57 times. Love it. They outrushed Arkansas 543 to 25. Remember what we discussed about Arkansas being like, hey, they're they're a power rushing team now. Yeah, they've improved anyway doing that. They averaged 0.8 yards Ah. on the ground. Ah. I love that Auburn ran the ball that many times because it's Gus Malzahn not outthinking it. We hear complaints from fan bases every week. You're averaging six yards per carry. We've heard it from Texas A&M fans forever. You're averaging six yards per carry. Why are you throwing the ball with an average quarterback? Hand the ball off. Do creative things on the ground if you if you really want to, but just keep draining the clock. Keep doing what you got to do on the ground. Auburn in that. There's not a single Auburn fan who I think is complaining today, which is, that's a treat. That is a treat, and it's a rarity. Uh, Cameron Petway was awesome to see. Gets to nearly 200 yards, and in watching this game, because I think it was 28-3 to at the half, do you have a relative tie at Thanksgiving who, or any holiday, or any time you're out, but like if you eat meat on a bone, Mm. that they go to it. Like My grandma was like this, where... 
that bone shined. It was picked oh, so yeah. clean. And sometimes you just sort of, you eat the meat off of it and you move Not on even to the next wing. How about hot wings? Yeah, I'm saying you have a friend at hot wings. Like I can see my reflection is, in the bone. I'm not kidding. Yeah. God's honest truth. Yeah. It is a real, dare I say, bone of contention. Oh no. Thank you. Yeah. Thank uh, you. I'll no. be in town all day. No, please leave early. <laughs> it is It is a bone of contention between my wife and I. Mm-hmm. How untidy I leave the chicken wing. And she is... She is like... A maniac. Yeah. In a good way. Okay. Yeah. So that's what, what Auburn did on the ground to Arkansas. They picked those bones clean. Yeah. So great for Auburn moving forward. They're going to be a top 15 team, presumably. They came in number 21 and they have Ole Miss on the road, Vandy, Georgia, um, I think an FCS game, and then they're on the road for the Iron Bowl. So okay. life's not bad right now. They're... they're that seat peaking is chilly at, for Gus Malzahn. Peaking at a good time. Yes, absolutely they are. Peaking at a good time. All right. One more game, then we'll do a uh, sponsor read here. Cool. Let's go over the Big 12. Oh, man. What a day. I love the, the Saturday and the Big 12 might have been my favorite by the conference. You really had a little bit of everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. Between West Virginia and their impressive victory mm-hmm. over TCU. Between Kansas State, I think, driving the final nail in the Charlie Strong coffin. Yeah. That was at least interesting. Slowly and brutal. <laughs> right. They had a 16 play drive, I think, in that game. Yeah. 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 They didn't drive it in with a hammer. They drove it in just with like force of human hands. What was the movie? Was it Austin Powers? I, I'm losing my memory, but where somebody is very slowly going to be run over by a steamroller <laughs> that's like 20 feet Who out. Framed Roger Rabbit. Was that what it was? Maybe. I don't remember. Uh, but that's what that game was. But continue. And then, of course, you had the video game. And I, I believe that's the proper way yeah. to describe Oklahoma, Texas Tech. Yeah, basketball. So let's go here. West Virginia, 34, TCU, 10. Mm-hmm. TCU had, they had a streak of 36 consecutive games scoring more than 20 points. Oops. Past tense, had. Yeah. Because they came into this one and... You know, West Virginia might not be elite class. They might not be up there with like Bama and May I Ohio jump State, in? Michigan. Ty Hildenbrandt's playoff team TCU Thank had you. a streak of 36 plus. I'm glad, that you, I'm glad that you clarified. Yeah, that. yeah. They might not be in the same class with Bama and Ohio State and Michigan and Washington and Clemson and uh, who else? Louisville. Mm-hmm. They might not be in that conversation, but they're getting there. Yeah. They're getting there because they looked really well rounded to me. They were good on defense. They forced, what, three turnovers? Mm hmm. From TCU, they held TCU to two for 11 on third down. And how Kenny many times Hill, did they turn the ball over West Virginia? Zero. That'd be a big fat zero. They held Kenny Hill to like 4.8 yards per completion. Mm-hmm. They are now 6-0. They're they are. on the road next week against Oklahoma State. This is a team that I think is gaining more confidence. And certainly as we kind of judge from afar, it is getting easier to feel confident in them now as they progress through this Big 12 schedule. And I believe it's TCU and Texas Tech scored a combined, in eight quarters, a combined 27 27. points. That's unbelievable. West Virginia has allowed 10, 11, 16, and 17 points against Power 5 teams this year. That 3-3-5 is confusing teams. They are wrapping up. They are doing everything, mind you, with a relatively new defense. They graduated and lost a lot of dudes last year, and they Skylar Howard is getting it done to an extremely efficient level. Russell Shell is giving them an element on the ground that I don't think he gave them early on in the season. They are a much more complete team than I think any of us anticipated, and they're a top 10 team. They are going to, I think they have Oklahoma State next week. Yeah. They have Oklahoma State road, next week on the, on the road. It's a it's a tough place. It's a tough game. I imagine they'll score more than 10 points, but at this point, I do not assume. Um it's it's hard to consider them anything but a fringe playoff team right now. Yeah. They've been really impressive. They're not atop the conversation because you'd like to see it against a ranked team, which I don't until Oklahoma, I don't think they have on their schedule. And that's later on in November, but they can only play who's in front of them and they're shutting the hell out of Good anyone. for them. Good for them. We have a lot of Mountaineer fans who listen to the verbal mm-hmm. and they have quietly and not so quietly requested that we no longer pick West Virginia to win. Okay. So we're done talking about they West want, Virginia. They want reverse jinx. Right. I which, had them. You had them. I had them covering. Yeah. I got a reverse jinx thing going on right now. Okay. I'm going to start using this for good. Okay. All right. Let's pay the bill. Like a hacker who is hired by a security firm right. to prevent other... To gotcha. find the vulnerability. Gotcha, gotcha, right. Gotcha. Right, 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 right. Okay. All right, so let's pay the bills here, Dan. Let's do it. You have a nice office here. Thank you very much. Are you, are you guys hiring? Always. Growing company. Really? Quickly growing. Absolutely. 
So when in due time we build out solid verbal media into like a publicly traded entity, Mm -hmm. it's going to be essential for us to figure out a way to post jobs online to find the best candidates. I think that's a reasonable thing. Yeah. All right. So you got to post it in more than one spot because not everyone uses the same website. You need, you need something, some tool, some utility that you can just go and post it once. And then it's going to go to all of the major job sites. Mm -hmm. If you want the perfect hire, you got to use ZipRecruiter. Ooh. Zip Recruiter. College football is all about recruiting. So is the rest of the business world, Dan. This is like a new thing. This is a great point. You got to get ZipRecruiter.com if you're interested in getting the best candidates. You post it once. It goes out to 100 plus job sites, including social media networks like Facebook and Twitter, all with one sing click. Mm-hmm. Did I say sing click? Something like that. I meant single click. <laughs> I like that. All I got right. it. Find the candidates in any city or industry nationwide. Post once. Post once, excuse me, and watch all of the qualified candidates roll in. ZipRecruiter has an easy-to-use interface that makes it hassle-free. You don't got to juggle emails. You don't got to deal with calls to the office. Quickly screen candidates, rate them, hire the right person fast. Find out today why ZipRecruiter is being used by over 1 million businesses. Right now, if you are a listener, if you are interested, you can post to ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash sportsfan. Ooh. Yeah, ZipRecruiter.com slash sportsfan. One more time, you can try it for free. Get those qualified candidates rolling in, Dan. <laughs> ZipRecruiter.com slash sportsfan. Let's play some video games. Okay. Beep, boop, bop, 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 beep, boop, boop, boop. Let's play our shootout sound. <laughs> I don't know if I'll add it in or not. Uh, but we'll see. 66 to 59, eh? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Um, Oklahoma's good. Baker Mayfield had a perfect day against the most imperfect defense, perhaps. And you know what? I really want Texas Tech's defense to improve under David Gibbs. That's I really do want that to happen. It did not happen yet. Hasn't happened yet. Uh, Baker Mayfield was right around 550 yards. Patrick Mahomes was well over 700. This is, look, this yards. is the losing effort to end all. Yeah. How do you compete with this sort of loss? Not only did he throw for five touchdowns and 734 freaking yards in mm-hmm. one football game. Mm-hmm. Do you know how many times he actually threw the ball? Uh, I have it in front of me. 88. This is shocking. 88. And if you add in his 12 carries, 100 plays with the ball. Good hell. He went to sleep last night in an ice bath. <laughs> this poor soul. Yeah, I, the big takeaway from this game is Oklahoma is good enough to keep scoring and score and score some more. And Texas Tech, man, it was so, like watching Patrick Mahomes in this game. You just want to be like, man, buddy, we got to introduce you to a defense. We got to do some networking. We got to get you. You need to meet Zip Justin. Recruiter. <laughs> Zip Recruiter. Patrick Mahomes needs to meet Bud Foster. Like just a one-on-one be like, so what do you, I mean, could I, I feel like I could fit in. I love, I love like the optics of a potential Craigslist misconnections ad out there. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it's it's a shame. He's doing everything he can. He's a junior, by the way. To win. If he graduates after this year and for whatever reason decides he wants to be a grad transfer, oh my God. He's got options. He has options. He's got options. Um, a battery, a litany. Myriad records were broken in this game. Yeah. Most combined yardage in a Division I game. Most combined passing yardage in any NCAA game. Damn. Pat Mahomes himself, he set the NCAA individual record for total offense in a game. 819 (laughs) combined passing and rushing yards. Uh. There was also a tie for the NCAA record for combined first downs in a game with 78, (laughs) which is a lot. Pat Mahomes also tied Connor Halliday, a friend from yesteryear, for most individual passing yards in a D1 game with 734. He shattered all of Texas Tech's own record books. And Baker Mayfield himself actually set a school record for passing touchdowns in a game. He had seven. Mm -hmm. There are a bunch of other ones here. I'm not going to read through all of them. Pretty much everything you'd expect between two passing teams or two able-bodied passing teams that put up a 66 to 59 total score. Incredible. Texas Tech... Home dog covered in a shootout. Boom. I believe I had that. And yes, Patrick Mahomes once again. For all those times in a losing effort. Me, 
Um, so this is how you do this now with your oh, iPhone. Oh yeah, you're seeing it. So yeah, I hold the, the phone up to this the This is how the sausage is made. This is, oh man. Can you name a movie this is from? Ooh. Okay. I, I'll give you the actors. Yeah. It's a movie about, I believe, news producers. And it's Robert Redford. And I want to get this right. I know it's Redford. Is it Michelle? What's it? Michelle Pfeiffer. God, I'm drawing a total blank, Dan. Up close and personal. There was another movie I was thinking of that. So there was a Harrison Ford one more recently, I think. Oh, man. Like Morning Glory or something. There, There's another one I'm thinking of. Oh, okay. Not exactly an unpopular song, but yeah. okay. Uh, and then let's keep it in the Big 12. Yes. K-State 24, Texas 21. Texas is now three and four. Mm -hmm. When we talked about an eight and four season, mm -hmm. we were not banking on this game being lost number four. Right. It was Austin Powers, by the way, the steamroller. Okay. I just you. looked it up and confirmed. Yes. There was a steamroller scene in Who Framed Roger Rabbit as well. Okay. But I don't think it was quite as dramatic. Yeah. Um, Baylor comes to town next week for Texas. This is not looking good for Charlie Strong. No. I don't mean to laugh because he's probably going to lose his job. And there's Living nothing out funny his about contract that, yeah. beyond this year, right? Yeah, I don't see it, it happening. Question. Mm -hmm. Did you see who else lost yesterday? Um, a lot of teams. Who, who am I looking for? Tom Herman went down. Tom Herman did go down because he doesn't want as much attention. Right. Does Tom Herman's, this is a stupid question, mm -hmm. does his stock go down at all? Listen, you know, since day one, I've been a Chad Morris guy. So yesterday just proved everything I've been saying this whole time. <laughs> no, I don't think his stock goes down. Because listen, how unrealistic is it, basically aside from Alabama, to say, yeah, we are thinking you're going to win 26 games in two years. So if you do that, like we think you should be able to do, maybe you'll make the playoff. <laughs> it's unrealistic. I mean, listen, Navy's a good team. SMU is that that loss was inexcusable. They lost by double digits and it was never even close. They, they quit in that game. Yes, they did. They quit, right? And I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I watched a ton of it. I will watch it probably in this this coming week, but it is uh, it is an inexcusable loss. But you know what? Other than teams like Alabama, this just happens. And I don't think it affects his stock in the slightest. K State won this game despite three turnovers. They controlled 38 minutes of clock. Texas just, they couldn't finish drives. For yeah. as good as the offense has been, K-State had their number. They also had 10 penalties. They mixed in a, a missed field goal mm -hmm. in their sort of a ugly sequence in the waning seconds of this game. Had an onside kick go out of bounds. Like I saw a stat that Texas, between the Kansas State game and the, I think, the Oklahoma game, off of seven forced turnovers... They turned those turnovers into three points. Yeah. Three points. That'll get you, That's right? That's not good enough. That'll get you. Yeah. So, look, it looks like Texas is going to be open. Yep. Nice win for K-State. Yeah, especially considering Jesse Ertz basically got torn in half the week before and he just beat yeah. Texas. Yeah, absolutely. Nice win for them. And um, Big 12 is going to be infinitely more interesting moving forward Ugh. than I think you or I had anticipated like three weeks ago. Oklahoma clearly has found its way on offense. West Virginia, as we learn more about them, I think we get more excited. Mm -hmm. And the whole Texas thing, just from afar, is going to be real interesting to watch. Over under of 16 and a half points scored by Texas hosting West Virginia on November 12th. <sighs> I'll go over. You're going to go over. I'll go over, but okay. maybe just by a half point. <laughs> okay. So are, is Texas going to succeed in their quest to 20 against West Virginia? No. Okay. I agree. No. Agree. All right. Uh, the other game that we'll just briefly mention here mm -hmm. was Oklahoma State 44, Kansas 20. Okay. For those of you who care. You know what? And I'm going to say this, and it's going to sound a little bit foolish, but most of what I say does. Kansas is 0-4 in the Big 12. I think they're 1-6 overall. Kansas is doing... They're better. They're do, they're totally better. Yeah. And it, you have to sort of see the forest through the trees kind of thing. They're doing little things. And I don't know when it will actually turn into wins, but you look at what they're ranked in categories across college football. That do matter. And they're like 57th. They're better. 70th. They're not 118th. They are better. They're better. They nearly... Yeah. I would have been so good if they beat TCU. I wanted that so badly. <laughs> it's um, It's got the hallmark of 
what Mike McIntyre did. Yes. I that's what I'm hoping for. Baby steps, incremental. You mm-hmm. gotta, you know, start it from the bottom. Now we're here. We're getting oh, there. Dude, now see so you come to my office. Quote Drake. Um yeah, I'm looking at their schedule. They're at home against Iowa State. Texas with perhaps the wheels all off, second to last game of the season on the road at Kansas State. It's it's definitely a front loaded schedule, unfortunately, for the Jayhawks, but they've been sort of persistently efficient. Okay. I mentioned Colorado. Ten to five. Their final <laughs> final score over uh Stanford. Yeah. Offense responsible for three of those points. Offense responsible for three. Nonetheless, congratulations to Colorado. Absolutely. I am glad we're both Bowl eligible. Here. And it's Six not even and November. Two. Six and two. Bowl eligible for the first time in forever. Mm-hmm. They are now staring down the barrel of a potential huge matchup with Utah. Yeah. Next month, which could well decide the Pac-12 South. The Pac-12 as a conference, as we all predicted... Rolls through the mountain time zone in the Apple Cup, <laughs> as we all predicted. Hell yes. Um, Although USC, I believe, is... I mean, Colorado has the... No, USC beat Colorado, so USC has that tiebreaker, but holy hell. Never what, know. What is Never season? know yeah. how things are going to break, but that's yeah. a big matchup. Big deal. Any way you slice it between Colorado and Utah. This game was really ugly. I mean, the final score was 10-5, to five, so mm-hmm. you kind of know what you're getting with a 10-5 game, even if you didn't watch it. Uh, Stanford, a disaster on offense. Ryan Burns had like three picks. Yep. Tack on another fumble. That's four turnovers. Mm -hmm. Christian McCaffrey, for his part, was okay. He's fine. But he's really all they have. Yep. He's all they got. Yeah, Stanford on offense is completely lost. I think they've now gone, I don't have the stat in front of me, but it's something like four straight games without scoring a touchdown in the first half. Yeah. What? Mm Mm-hmm. This is coming off of an all-purpose, record-setting year for Christian McCaffrey in 2015. And we assume, I mean, basically it's coming down to maybe we did not give enough credit to Kevin Hogan and what he was able to do over his four years starting at quarterback for Stanford. But still, the offensive line has struggled and the defense has been like good for Stanford, even though they've been beat up. They've been like outside of maybe the Wazoo game and the Washington game. They've been fine. Those are two hugely potent teams on offense. And... If you hold Colorado to 10 points, you should be beating Colorado. Yeah. Saifal Lufau is a good quarterback. This is a good offense. Colorado left points uh, on the field, missed a bunch of field goals. I think they put their punter in at Kinker at one point, and he missed a field goal. But, man, what a win. Colorado, you tell them before the season starts, yeah, you're going to go to Stanford and Oregon and win both. Yeah. So, good. I love it so much. Yeah, we had, I believe, some calls from people, mm-hmm. Buffalo fans, who may have been crying. Good for them. Yeah, this is exciting. So so good on that. Staying in the Pac-12, though. Yes. yes. An unlikely shootout between Utah and UCLA. Utah wins <laughs> 52 to 45. Yep. Monster game for Joe Williams. You know what's special about Joe Williams, Dan? Uh, literally everything, but yes, I do know, but please tell the people. You're going to say that he quit a couple weeks ago to mm-hmm. pursue his degree. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you that he's the pride and joy of Emmaus PA. Is that is that true? Where's Emmaus? Pride and joy of uh, Emmaus, PA, a quaint community in the long shadow of Dorney Park and Wildwater Kingdom. Wow, I do not and know any of these things. a nearby Yakos Hot Dog location. Okay, okay, fair. He quit on the team last uh, last month mm-hmm. to focus on his degree yesterday. I would say retired time. Retired, okay, whatever. Retired. I'm sorry. Semantics. Okay. Tom- sem- tomato, tomato. He had 29 carries for 332 total yards. Oh, my God. And four touchdowns in this game, mm-hmm. powering the Utes to victory over UCLA. Retiree. <laughs> yes. Williams, recent retiree. Um, UCLA, I believe, threw the ball 70 times with their backup quarterback, Mike Faithful. 40 for 70. For his part, mm-hmm. had it not been for what Baker Mayfield and Pat Mahomes did mm-hmm. in their pinball game. Right. He would have had a solid case for in a losing effort. Yeah, I mean, four ninety five, five touchdowns. Yeah, yeah, he did, and I, but he had four picks, something like that. Something like that. He had something like four picks. It's a lot of. It's a big number if you didn't fully watch the game. But UCLA, which I don't fully blame them for, they haven't been able to run the ball for squat this year, and 
Yes, it's difficult to say all of a sudden, so we're going to sort of be an air raid team going into week eight. <laughs> but they their offense looked like what it was these past few years with Noel Mazzoni in that they were getting the ball to the edges instead of running the ball. They were, you know, swing passes, much more wide open spread look because the throws were easier for a backup quarterback who was struggling in their pro style sets these past couple of weeks in Josh Rosen's absence because of injury. So it's... uh it's a UCLA team with no answer, and their strength was their defense, but no answer for a pretty straightforward rushing attack from Utah. We're going to have a hell of a contest this year mm-hmm. for bust of the year. Oh, man. It is easily going to be the most contested uh, bust of the year. I, that we've I ever opened had. up the form yeah, for Verbi nominations. If you're not a subscriber to our newsletter of intent, you can go on out to you know, the Facebook page, the the Twitter. We, we got it all over the place, basically. Yeah. Um, I will post that link elsewhere, but one of the categories you can nominate for is is Bust of the Year. Mm-hmm. Used to have a different name that we're no longer acknowledging on the program. Right. But between UCLA and Notre Dame, mm-hmm. Oregon mm-hmm. is in the mix. There are a whole handful of other teams Stanford, that are... Stanford, yeah. Stanford, sure. A bunch of other teams that are going to be in the mix here. It's going to be hotly contested, and UCLA is definitely. I mean, Alabama couldn't cover against Texas A and M. Just ridiculous. So yeah, and we should also point out, and Ty, please stop me if I'm incorrect here. Verbies, 2016 Verbies yeah. live show, New York, potentially. Potentially, if we can find a venue that can seat 37,000 people yep. in the greater New York area. No, we are going to sell cheap tickets. Hopefully, maybe raise some money for charity. I don't know what we're going to do. Raise some money for us. Um, and we are aiming to shoot a live show or record a live show in uh, in the greater New York area in December. So yeah, maybe s- stay tuned. We're, we're sure, hoping for. Not it. sure if that will be Verbies. Oh, but, okay. But the working something. The working theory is that we're going to try and do it sometime early December. So yes, pay attention to the Twitter feed, yeah. to Facebook, to the newsletter of intent for uh, further details. Okay. Um, keeping it in the Pac-12 very quickly. Mm-hmm. Both Washington teams. Juan, Washington, 41-17 over Oregon State. Washington State, 37-32. The highlight for me was the exchange of words between Mike Leach and Todd Graham after the game. Okay, this was on my DVR. Pardon my French for saying this earmuff if you've got kids in the car. I believe Todd Graham called Mike Leach a chicken shit. Ooh. Which, I mean, them's fighting words. Well, I mean, you knew about the arguments going into the game with accusations that Arizona State steals signals and signs and whatever and is on the sideline trying to decode the whole game. So that is a thing. Um, Yeah, two of the more fiery personalities in the Pac-12. I love it. Controversial statement here. Yeah. Were you ever um, in the situation where you were on a team and you were riding the bench? I'm sure. I mean, hypothetically. My entire year of varsity baseball, my junior year, Uh was spent decoding signals. Really? Yeah. I'm a little bit of a wind talker. The last time I rode the bench was probably basketball in like freshman year of high school. That was it. If you've never done it, it's actually kind of fun. I like it, yeah. If you've never done it, it's actually kind of fun to decode the signals. Mm -hmm. A little bit of a game within the game. Totally illegal. Were you good? I was the best. Oh, man. I was the best. Like in the action movie uh-huh. where they hire the best for one last job. Mm-hmm. If you need to steal signs from a third base coach. Listen, it's going to be a lot nicer in Tempe these next few weeks than it's going to be in the greater Allentown area. Solidverbal at gmail.com. Hit us up, Todd Graham. All right. Um, and then there was Cal Oregon. Yeah, there was. I will give you how many seconds do you want? <sighs> 30, 20. I'll give you 30 seconds. Um,. Yeah, Oregon's first half was real bad. They have a true freshman quarterback who was promising, but threw a backbreaking uh, interception at the end of the game. Davis Webb was hurt. All of Cal seems to be hurt, but they have their act together a lot to a lot further of a degree than Oregon does and um, ran all over the Ducks, but Oregon did a nice job adjusting in the second half. They only allowed 11 points in the second half, but it wasn't enough. And if you are a truly wounded Oregon fan who likes wounding yourself, you will now realize that Oregon is three decent throws from being five and two. Are they going to fire Mark Helfrich? I don't think they will. No? I think there will be a staff overhaul. Unless this is the... I mean, what are they now? 0-4 in the Pac-12? If they lose every Pac-12 game, 
Oregon State's not good. Uh, I don't remember who else they have. Arizona State's not great. If they lose every single one of those games and the locker room is totally lost and there's a sense that they are not going to have any inclination to fight for Mark Helfrich players-wise, uh, it would be hard to see. But if they go 4-8, and eight, I think he's back. What if Chip Kelly's out there? I think that's done. Yeah. I honestly think that's done. I don't think Chip's coming back to Eugene. I think they don't want to bring Chip back. Okay. Yeah. I'd love it, but I... As a fan, you gotta be excited yeah. about at least that theory. Right? There is There is also the fact that his last recruiting class, his final recruiting class in Oregon was like secretly not the best, and that maybe four years is about what he had in him in Eugene. Okay. So well, it'll that's be all. interesting to follow. Yeah. You know, we'll have to see what they do. Uh, all right, where do you want to go next? We've got a bunch of games in the Big Ten that we have to touch on. Yeah, let's go on. to the Big Ten. ACC, we didn't touch at all, but okay, let's go Big Ten. We had this whole Wisconsin-Iowa game, Dan. We did have this whole Wisconsin-Iowa game. That is factually correct. Um, we said on Wednesday that we didn't expect either team to hit 20 points. And we were. That could well have been the smartest thing we said all Lock year. Lock of the week of the week, yeah. Iowa held to 2 of 13 on third down. Oh. Wisconsin led almost entirely by defense. Mm-hmm. They held Iowa to 236 total yards and no touchdowns for the first time all year. Mm-hmm. Just a huge, ugly, um, functional win, shall we say, for yeah. Wisconsin. That's not to say Iowa's a bad team. In a potential letdown spot coming off an Ohio State overtime loss. Hey, you hit it on the head. Yeah, Iowa is... Fine. Mm-hmm. They're not Iowa from a year ago. Mm-hmm. Not Iowa from a year ago. There are elements of that team from a year ago, but they're still not like they don't have the same luster. They're not as consistent as they were a year ago, and they're not firing on as many cylinders this season. Right. So when you see that Wisconsin beat Iowa 17 to 9, I don't know if anyone is wildly surprised by that, especially given the fact there was letdown potential. Did you see the Kirk Ferentz quote about so there was a reporter that asked him you're down 14-6, and you decide to punt instead of going for it. And Kirk Ferentz, and listen, we've had Kirk Ferentz on the show. Kirk Ferentz is super nice, genuine guy. We like him a lot. Just human to human, as as little as we know him. He responded to the, you were down 14-6 to six question, and why didn't you go for a touchdown with, it's a two-possession game at yeah. that point. And you just think to yourself, oh, he actually said that. He's, he's, my impression of Kirk was that he was a bit robotic. Mm -hmm. And now after this quote, he's a robot that they didn't teach math to. Oh man, you're so mean. That's the truth. I thought he was, I thought he was very non-robotic as a person. I mean, we asked him, (laughs) what do you watch? What's your favorite current movie? And he did act a little bit like Siri when you ask Siri a question that it doesn't know. (laughs) And he responded with the Godfather day. Man. Okay. He was I, a nice guy. Yeah. And I hope he found his luggage, but <laughs> just saying, this is not, not a good answer yeah. um, to your fan base if they're wondering similarly why you didn't go for a touchdown. I believe the leading receiver's longest catch was 11 yards. Yeah. Receiver, not running back, even though Akram Wadley left, led them with, uh, with uh, receiving yards. So, not great. I was fine, but... That's as extreme as you can get about this team. Nebraska 27, Purdue 14. Purdue actually led at half. Mm -hmm. And there may have been a little bit of look-ahead potential here. Beat them last year. Yeah. Yeah, of course. There may have been a little look-ahead potential here for Nebraska with that big Wisconsin game. I don't know how much we really take away from this. Next week is going to be the bellwether for me. Mm -hmm. How good is Wisconsin moving forward? How legit is Nebraska? Because I'm still not sure we have a hundred percent feel for how good the Cornhuskers really are. Uh, Tommy Armstrong is one hundred percent going to need to beat Wisconsin on the road, and I don't feel great about it. I like Nebraska a lot. I don't feel great about it. All right, uh, and staying in the Big Ten, mm-hmm. Northwestern ten point win against Indiana, huh? America's team. Yeah, uh, Northwestern. Won this game against a an okay Indiana team at this point. How many points did they score in the second half there, Ty? Zero. Yeah. Point zero. 
That defense is so good, especially up front. Um, they're not the greatest defense in the Big Ten, but they are playing at an extremely high level nationally. Uh, they score early. They don't do anything in the second half offensively, but they just completely eliminated a, a pretty decent Indiana offense. So good for Northwestern, who now themselves, they move to 3-1. and one. They are in the Big Ten West, and that's sort of a mess right now, <laughs> the yeah. Big Ten West, and I love it. Nebraska wins 27 to 14. I am excited about previewing that game next week. Absolutely. That's so going to be an awesome, awesome setting for a football uh, game. Rutgers almost won. I saw that. 34 32, they lost to Minnesota. Yes, they almost beat Minnesota, who is not particularly good, but good for Rutgers for competing for four quarters and coming close, I suppose. Maryland won 28 to 17. The Notre Dame stank is real. Oh, it's so real. It is real. It is spectacular. And it is just beating the hell out of Michigan State right now. Unbelievable. It's 28 17, Maryland. This is where we are right now. And Maryland moves to 5 and 2. We yeah. are close to November and they're at 500 in the Big Ten. Man, and impressive did, first stanza and for. We didn't mention it during the yeah. the Colorado game, but who was the last team Notre Dame played <laughs> before the bye week? Yeah, I mean, that would okay. be the Stanford Cardinal. The Stanford Cardinal. The Notre Dame stink is so real. Texas is about to perhaps fire their coach. Yep. Stanford can't score with Christian McCaffrey. Michigan State can't win a game in the Big Ten. Yep. Yeah, Notre Dame's pets' heads are falling off. They are okay. And uh, finally, in the Big Ten, Mm -hmm. Michigan 41, Illinois 8. The only real, well, two interesting tidbits here. Mm -hmm. Michigan outgained Illinois 561 to 172. Mm -hmm. I actually got more pleasure from the fact that there is a Jeff George Jr. (laughs) And that he only completed four passes in this game for Illinois. Okay, he'll improve. He'll get there. (laughs) I hope. Illinois, another team that I am convinced is doing enough decent things that they're not going to be terrible for, for a particular long time. Wilton Spate did a great job in this game of spreading the ball around. Uh, Karan Higdon was really good on the ground. It, it's Every week it's a different running back. And defensively, Michigan was exactly what Michigan has been all year long. And Michigan, outside of perhaps Alabama, and I only say perhaps, plays defense better than anyone does anything in the country and cannot wait to see them do it against the one good team remaining on their schedule. The four games in front of me. By the way, how many road games has Michigan played? Just add it up in your head right now. We're going into Halloween week. Yeah, not many. One. Not many, yeah. Six of their seven games have been in Ann Arbor. Yeah, and it was at Rutgers. Okay. Uh, The four games I have before me in the ACC now, Mm -hmm. Florida State and Clemson were both off. They've got a huge game next week. Mm Mm-hmm. But the big one, if we're going to pick, would probably be the Thursday night game yeah. between Virginia Tech and Miami. And Virginia Tech just took it to the Canes. I don't know if the Canes are in like full-on Mark Rick losing control mode or not, but 37-16 <laughs> to 16 was your final score. Yeah, Tech sacked Brad Kaya eight times. Unbelievable. In this football game, clearly getting enough out of their defense to remain competitive, to get things back on the straight and narrow, and I think make the final push now in their side of the ACC. Oh, absolutely. Gerard Evans was incredibly affi- incredibly efficient. Excuse me. Um, they ran the ball well defensively. I think they just allowed, they didn't allow anything in the fourth quarter when it was sort of out of hand, but they shut Miami down for this game. They, like, they allowed that one big play to Joe Yearby. Yeah. That was pretty much it. That was it. The whole game. And this is their schedule, finishing out the season. At Pitt, at Duke, Georgia Tech, at Notre Dame, Virginia. They do not finish with a ranked team in their final five. And it's they're, they're sort of controlling. I mean, I don't know. I don't have the standings in front of me. Their loss was to Tennessee out of conference and to Syracuse. So one ACC loss, they're controlling their destiny. And man, did not anticipate this in year one of Justin Fuente. No. Fuente. So. Been good. Love to see it. Louisville 54, NC State 13. This was interesting only because NC State um, gave us cause for pause. They put on their uniforms in the right direction. (laughs) They gave us some cause for pause. Yeah, that's true. They almost beat Clemson. They beat Notre Dame in the monsoon. Mm -hmm. But they could have a little bit of Notre Dame stank on them too now. 
Whew. It's hard to fully say because Lamar Jackson is un- an unbelievable talent and he is going to do this. This will not be the final decent team he will do this to, but man, so he only accounts for four touchdowns? Yep, yep. That's a down week. Let that sink in. That is a 355 down week. through the air, three touchdowns, 76 rushing. It's it's okay. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, Lamar Jackson has to be considered your Heisman front runner still. Oh my God, yeah. He has 34 touchdowns on the year. Yeah, with the exception of snippets here and there from like Who? other running backs in the country. Yes. You know, they've they've all shown signs. Yeah. But outside Lamar Jackson. Who would you even put in the conversation? At this point? It's uh, a little bit of a tougher question than you'd expect. Okay, so in terms of... So it's a it's a quarterback-heavy award. So Jake Browning has been better as a thrower than any quarterback in the country. I think that's fair to say, this season. Uh, the Pac-12 has been incredibly down. Not his fault. He has put up insane numbers against uh, the teams that he has played against. But, man, running back-wise, Dalvin Cook is still great. Um Leonard Fournette may have played himself back into that conversation. Yeah, I mean, uh, He's going to have to do it against Alabama. The point is that nobody right. has been as consistent all year long as Lamar Jackson. Yeah. It really hasn't even been close. Right. There are definitely tons of headlining players that we could say, oh yeah, like they're Heisman worthy. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it's only been in flashes. It hasn't been the whole year through the way it has for Jackson. Yeah, I, I'm very happy to welcome Baker Mayfield back to New York after what he's been able to do this season. Uh, Pat particularly, Mahomes, does he get any love? I mean, you got to win more games on the other side of the ball, but got to win more games than what Texas Tech has done. Okay. But Oklahoma, in the degree of difficulty with losing what they lost on both sides of the ball, and Baker Mayfield not really missing a step, I think is is in that conversation. All right. Also, North Carolina thirty five to fourteen over UVA. Mm-hmm. General Mitch Trubisky. General Mitch three ten three touchdowns. Elijah Hood finally getting back. Yeah, slow into, start for uh, the, the Tar Heels, but yeah, up into triple digits, but. UNC, you know, don't look now, but they are headed for a 10-2 and season. They've got a big game looming later in the year with NC State, but it's at home. I would think at this point they should win. NC, NC uh, North Carolina, excuse me, looking pretty good for 10-2. and Overlooking the Citadel with a very good record recently <laughs> against a Carolina school. And then there was Syracuse. Syracuse won 28-10, or 28-20, excuse me, over Boston College. Eric Dungy, a really good game. Syracuse now 4-4. Four and four. To get to a bowl, they need to beat two of Clemson, Florida State, NC State, and Pitt. Tough, tough sliding. Tough road, but NC State and Pitt are at least um, average enough <laughs> that you can ask the question. Yes, and Eric Dungy, as you mentioned, incredibly efficient. Really picking up this offense. Uh, Dino Babers has done a very good job slowly introducing it. And yes, it's just Boston College. BC has not won an ACC game, but... The efficiency is really nice. 32 of 38 for 434. That will do, Eric Dungy. That will do. All right. Very quickly, got to pay more bills. Okay. I'm okay you with know, this that. road trip ain't paying for Keep itself. Keep the lights yeah. on. Uh, you ever use SeatGeek? All the time. We had more people write to us this week and last week mm-hmm. and the week before and the week before. People who have used SeatGeek to buy tickets to games. I believe the best man at my wedding was at UCLA, Utah. Nice. Yesterday. Did you have a good time? He had a great time. Nice. He used SeatGeek to buy his tickets. Right. May have used the solid verbal offer code. Everything about the product is designed to make your life easy. They do price comparisons for you. They search all the ticket sites. They even give you a grade on all of these tickets. So you can look right there in front of you. It's a free app. They'll tell you where the value is. Yeah. And that's what it's all about. Because unless you're looking to spend an arm and a leg, you want to know where the value is. And that's what SeatGeek can do for you. Um, They want to get you the most bang for your buck. So that's why they do this. It is a free app for your phone. All you need to do is go to your app store of choice, download SeatGeek, and punch in the game, the concert, whatever big event it is you're interested in attending. SeatGeek has you hooked up. Right now, if you're a solid verbal listener, you can get a $20 rebate off your very first SeatGeek purchase. So it's a good deal. Nice. Download the app. Go into settings. Click add a promo code. The promo code for us is SOLID. S-O-L-I-D. S-O-L-I-D. Again, that's how you spell SOLID. Mm-hmm. Can If you confirm. make a purchase, your very first purchase, they're going to send you $20 after you make it. Again, it's free. 
Promo code is solid. There are a bunch of big games coming up. Lord knows there are always big concerts mm -hmm. in and around the metropolitan areas of the area. United States. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not one of the tri-states. Jersey, um, Jersey, Connecticut, New I'm York. close ah, enough. Ah, interesting. Three and a half. Quad states. Everybody's saying quad states now. Get with it. Seat Geek. Promo code solid. Do it. All right. What else do we got here? Can I jump in? I'm going to jump in and insist that we talk about something. Yeah. We received not two, not three, not four, but one tweet requesting we talk about Temple, South Florida. Ow! Ow! Okay. 46 to 30. This was also Thursday night. Yeah. Ty, what do you know about a, a gentleman named Praise? I don't know much, but I know he had two and a half tackles for loss. What do you know about Avery Robinson getting into that that bull backfield a ton? Probably not a lot. What do you know about Ryquel Armstead? Ten and a half yards per carry? 200 yards in this game. Listen, it's not a visual medium, but raise your hand if you doubted Temple this season. And that would be... Ty Hildenbrandt. <laughs> that would be Ty Hildenbrandt raising his hand, pointing at himself. Matt Rule doing all things considered. Look, they lost to Army. It's not pretty. Army's fine. They're, they're definitely improved this season. They lost yesterday um, to, I believe, North Texas. Seth Luttrell doing a nice job for North Texas. They lost to Penn State in a close game. They came back against Penn State. They lost to a pretty good Memphis team. But they've now beaten Scott Frost and UCF. They've now beaten USF. They beat SMU, who just beat Houston, of course. And don't look now, but Temple is a game from being bowl eligible. And if you have followed Temple at all before these past few years, you know that's not a small deal. No, it isn't. Temple it isn't. football continues to win, continues to be a name for perhaps not the biggest recruits in the Northeast, but, I mean, Tyler Matikavich right now, he's on the Steelers roster. He plays for the Steelers. They are slowly but surely building up the Temple football brand. Philip Walker, a nice enough day for yeah. Temple. And USF is a good team. USF's a good team. And to your point about what they're doing at Temple, yeah, they're building a stadium for Temple. Heck yeah, they are. They're building a stadium. And for people who aren't as familiar with the greater Philadelphia area, mm -hmm. they talk Eagles 52 weeks out of the year. Mm -hmm. Even when the Phillies are playing well, they're still finding some way to shoehorn in an Eagles discussion. This is very much a pro football city, but it's a right. football blue collar city. Yeah. And I have seen definitely in the last two seasons now an uptick in the interest in Temple football. They still might not be talking as much about it on talk radio, but people in Philly care. And you can now go to like merchandise stores, mm -hmm. even up by me in Allentown and find a lot more temple gear than you could in years past. And I got to believe that's how something starts. Yeah. Who knows how long Matt rules going to be there. I think they've got a good coach in him. Yeah. He's going to be a name that comes up. Yeah. If, if the coaching carousel is, half as exciting as I think you and I expect it to be this offseason. Mm -hmm. Matt Rule's a name. He interviewed for what, Missouri a year ago? I believe so, yeah. Maybe Virginia. He, he's going to be a name that comes up. I hope for Temple's sake, they're able to retain him to open up that new stadium with him. It, it'd be nice, but good on them. Also, shout out to Stella the Owl. Regarding this game, do you see who called this game? Is our, is our buddy Adam? Our boy Adam Amin. Adam, love Adam Amin. Yeah, and Mac Brown. They were Shaking both in, care uh, of business. in South Philly for this one. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, elsewhere. Yeah. We mentioned the SMU win. Did we mention the Western Michigan victory? Uh, Michigan's one true team? Yeah. Row that boat. No, we have not mentioned it yet. 8-0? 45-31 to 31 over Eastern Michigan. A, Western an over Eastern. An improving Eastern, yeah. That's right. Good on them. They are uh, undefeated. They were twentieth in the nation before this football game. Okay, moving on up. I believe that's going to uh, that's going to improve. And then also Navy. Navy is. I, I think we wrote them off. I apologize in uh, the wake up college football episode we filmed this morning. It was our apology episode about everything we sort of overlooked or got wrong. And even though Navy has been pretty good for a while now, I sort of assume you no know, Keenan Reynolds, you know, this Heisman caliber, uh, do everything quarterback and talent for the, the midshipman is gone. Maybe they take a step back. They're ranked. Will Worth has done a good job in sort of relief. And they have not, they've beaten Houston. They have not taken a step back to anybody. They have Notre Dame soon, I believe. Yeah. I mean, to beat Houston and Notre That's Dame. That's going to be fun. <sighs> I'm sorry, man. That's I, if, gonna be fun. If I have anything to hang my hat on as an Oregon fan, at least we don't have to play an option we're, team. <laughs> we're in the same boat. Yeah. We're in the same boat. I think Oregon's defense is probably worse. Yeah. Um, but that's saying something for Notre Dame, because mm -hmm. Notre Dame, for their part, 
yeah. is bad, but improving a little bit. Sure. There have been baby steps over the last couple of weeks. Do you remember? I, it might have been 2007, and I could be getting this completely wrong because, again, it's what I do. I think it was 2007. Did Michael Dell put up like $40 million to try to like have an exhibition playoff at the end of the year? I feel like there was something like that year, something in there to like have or have a, two teams play after the fact, like one a plus one system. Can we convince Michael Dell to have a solid verbal between two, three, and nine teams and just play in a park and halfway between Eugene and South Bend? How much would we need to put up <sighs> as an entity? To have them play an exhibition yeah. in January at some point, January 15th. <sighs> Travel costs, it, probably at least $5 million, $3 okay, million. Okay, we don't dollars. have that. No, we do not. Let's find a prominent Oregon alum mm-hmm. and a prominent Notre Dame alum, and maybe we can sponsor like a wrestling match or something. So Ann Curry and Regis Philbin. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Morning show war. I like Let's that. Talk, we'll talk about this when we hit yeah. stop. Uh-huh. That's all I got here. That's all you have? I mean, there were a couple SEC games. I guess I should mention it would be wrong to overlook Kentucky beating... Missouri lost to Middle Tennessee State. Yeah, Uh. Kentucky beat Mississippi State. South Carolina beat UMass. Mm -hmm. Uh, Vandy beat Tennessee State. Hey, good. So, yeah, the Missouri thing wasn't great. Uh, Gunnar Keel with 350 yards. He's still playing college football. Started the game for Cincinnati. Started the year, I believe, third string. Came in and Cincinnati now has a winning record. That's a thing. I don't know. ECU is not ECU right now. They're they had 19 points, good. as did New Mexico State. Also <laughs> had 19 points. There were three teams that had 19 points. Three teams that had 19 points. Uh, Utah State beats Fresno State in the sort of middle to bottom of the Mountain West. Here's something I want to pay attention to, just very briefly, because my mind is always in, who is a coach who has succeeded to a certain extent that is west of the Mississippi that perhaps if things do not go well and continue to go well for Oregon, that they would look at. That is, you know, they're not, Oregon's not getting Tom Herman. Um, Craig Bull at Wyoming. Ooh. 3-0 and in the Mountain West. They've lost a ton these past couple of years as he's come over from North Dakota State, the Bison. Craig Bull, I believe, is a trestle guy, I want to say. Wyoming's now 5-2, and 3-0 and in the Mountain West. And if he wins 10 games next year, I, I might be happy with that. I could Going be talking bowling? to that. I could go bowling. Okay. Uh, the other day, I mean, I mentioned Utah State winning, but Matt Wells is another highly regarded name um, west of the Mississippi. Other than that, Ty, I mean, I think Lafayette got murdered. Lafayette got drilled. Lehigh is still putting up points in boatloads and a weird... Did they win? Yeah, they did Lehigh, win. They, they killed the, the cross haters. Yeah, I watched part of this game. Okay. This game was on early in the day mm-hmm. and there were no good games on right. early in the day unless you're counting Wisconsin, Iowa, and my eyes bled after a while with that one. <laughs> so I flipped on, on local TV, mm-hmm. the whole Lehigh Holy Cross game. And how was it? High quality. It was high quality. I actually kind of enjoyed it. Okay. And then there was a rare defensive showing between... Fordham and Georgetown. Fordham edged out Georgetown. Okay. 17-14. 17-14. I'm looking at the Pat League standings, Ty, and I know you already have these memorized, but who do you believe sits atop the Pat League? I want to talk about the Pat League. Okay. And then we're going to, I guess, hit stop. We'll end this charade. Yeah. How many conference games are there in the Pat League? (laughs) Not many. Because I believe it was last week, week seven, Georgetown played its very first conference game. Yeah. Yeah. who is scheduling these games? I can't even click a Pat League team on the standings to see. But um, yeah, Lehigh is atop the conference. They're 3-0. and Overall, they're 6-2. and So yeah, they couldn't have that many teams left. Lehigh atop the Pat League. Lafayette at the bottom. Everybody else sort of running together. But Fordham is also 2-0 and in the conference. So Fordham and Lehigh tied at the top. And Georgetown and Multisport Field and Lafayette with Richard Rubenstein Stadium sitting last. All right. There you have it. Week 8. In the books, it's a lot easier to do this show. It's so much easier. I think it'll be a quicker edit for you too, right? I might not edit at all. Oh, okay. That's fine. You're like eight feet away from me. This is great. Close enough. It's good to see you. Dan looks healthy. Oh, thank you very much. So do you. you what healthy? should we do for lunch? I don't know. I mean, it's not going to matter once people are listening to this. Yeah. I was thinking about, I'm going to take Ty to get Ethiopian. I'm going to go real out there with it. Just see how he reacts. But Ethiopian's actually pretty good. Whatever, whatever is nearby. Yeah, we'll figure out something nearby. Okay. Well, thank you for the invite up. This yeah. has been a lot of fun. Thanks for coming. We'll have to do it again sometime soon. Mm-hmm. We appreciate everyone writing in, calling in, tweeting in, Facebooking in. You know where you can find us. Please do subscribe at iTunes.com slash Solid Verbal. 
give us a rating, give us a review. You can also do the same now on Facebook. All that stuff helps us grow the footprint yes. of the Solid Verbal. We'll be back Tuesday, Wednesday, whenever we decide to record and preview. It'll be released nine. on Wednesday, right? We'll release it on Wednesday, but there are a handful of uh, very big it's notable very, games. Week nine's going to be great. I also forgot to thank people last week. So by all means, Sean Bowie, Bowie, probably Bowie, uh, Mike Ellis, Rick Munt, Scott Earl, the Thrilla Gorilla. I yeah. like that I got to the Holly to the G, Devin Miller, Avery Bowley, Jacob 197, Joey Weaver, Mad, Mad Maynad. I really hope that's a weird autocorrect, but thank you, Mad Maynad. So yeah, those are the thank yous. All right. Those and are thank people that you. shared it in a very impressive way. And thank you again to everybody who just downloads and takes a more yeah. voyeuristic approach. Mm-hmm. And we continue to ask Ty what time it is on Twitter. No, don't. <laughs> did you get a bunch of tweets? I did, actually. Oh, okay, yeah. Good. yeah, okay. Fun. For that guy over there, Dan Rubenstein, literally over there about eight yes. feet directly in front of me for myself, Ty Hilton Brand. This is the Solid Verbal, live in New York today. Yeah. Catch you all in a few days. Stay solid. Peace.